All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast, episode number 216. As oh, always, God. I'm your host, Bailey Eichbrett, and joined with me is the captain, Mr. Andy Full. What's going 216 on, dude? 216 already. I know. Time's kind of flying, buddy. Yeah. It's, I was just like reminiscing the other day, and I was like, man, I think I've been co host here for almost a year. Like, is it almost a year? Yeah, I want to say it's almost a year. It's got to be. It's got to be at least a year. Because I think you were last January is when we hit 100. Yeah. I think that's when we announced that you were going to become a, a co-host. Yeah, so, yeah, it's been a while. Fun times. Heck yeah, buddy. Sky's the limit. Yeah. And for some reason, we have a bunch of people that love to listen to our, our dumb heads talk oh. every Monday and Friday. Oh, so. I don't know why. <laughs> we even got complaints from people asking why we're going from three episodes to two episodes a week because apparently they like to hear our dumb heads talk that much that they want us three times a week not two and maybe what we'll have to do is um do like three times over the winter when there's not much going on and yeah. then in the summertime we can do two i think that's a really good plan it's i think it's good that you just brought that up because like yeah winter months we're just tinkering with tackle and then beyond then, like tournament season, we're full bore into it. And Andy and I tried, like even like without tournaments starting, but fishing starting up in the in the Northeast, we tried it. We were exhausted, <laughs> exhausted. I'm still but, tired. I won't, go, <laughs> I won't go down that tangent hole. So. Yeah, dude, you had uh, you had quite the uh, weekend of guide trips. Yeah, just unfortunately, just uh, Saturday, the weather was pretty bad on Sunday. But um, yeah, we're still getting into them really good on Erie um 30 40 50 60 fish days sometimes so we're doing pretty good but yeah, right now we'll yeah we're in the heat of the spawn so i try not to target spawners all that much just because it's gobies and don't want to mess up their reeds too bad but yeah we still have some pre-spawners and post-spawners are starting to play a little so it's good Post spawners yeah Dang, the, the spawn's going on in Erie, and you didn't invite me yet. It's I thought it's, we were friends. It's starting. <laughs> like uh, last week, like one or two were caught. Now I'm hearing of like five, six, or seven a day caught. So it's getting going. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to add this in here because John always has the greatest comment of every show. <laughs> I don't know where he comes up with his creative mind, but he always slides in my DM with some sort of creative comment. Brilliant. <laughs> yes, uh, the weekend went pretty well for me. I was uh, getting anyway. there. Uh, we are now for the local trail, three for three on, on Derb wins. They might not uh, let you back. <laughs> they might hate me over there, but no, they're a good group of guys to hang out with. Um, but dude, like, I didn't even think I was gonna win. I told you this, I told Forrest as I was getting off the water, I was like, dude, I might be top 10 because I had really high expectations for the way okay, Yugo was fishing. It was just one of those, just one of those deals. Caught all males and found one female. All my other females on beds left, they're completely yeah. gone. That's the issue with spawning derbies. Is you found those fish on what Wednesday or Thursday night. Thursday Two days night. later, they can leave, especially mm -hmm. the big females. Sometimes they're only there for six, 10, 12 hours. So it was an interesting deal. And obviously, uh, we'll talk more about this um, after the show, towards the end. Uh, once we, uh, um, we're going to get uh, Mr. Tyler Anderson on here in a second. And then afterwards, we will uh, break into more of uh, that, some tournament talk and, uh, but yeah, it was it was really interesting. It was it was kind of like I think the carp messed some things up, and I have an interesting theory as to why I think that happened. Um, but we won't get into that now. We're going to talk about that obviously after we have Tyler on here, because more importantly, we have some really good juice we're going to talk about. Because Tyler is very obviously set his uh, set his tone in the industry, uh, created a name for himself, created his own brand. That uh, if you're in the fishing industry and you know at least an ounce of something, you know who Tyler is. So um, we're pretty excited to get him on here. Yeah, to, it should uh, be a great show. Talk. Yeah, talk about his route, and hopefully, uh, obviously, Andrew and I are going to learn a lot from him, but hopefully you guys as well. So make sure you guys are getting questions in for him and uh, let him uh, you know, let him, let him, him hear some good stuff because, obviously, he has the knowledge to teach many of you, and if it's something that you're looking to do, get in the industry, um, this is the guy to talk to. So I think without further ado, we should bring him on here. 
Mr. Tyler Anderson. What's going on, dude? How's it going, folks? Good evening. How is it in sunny Texas right now? Well, we're actually in sunny Florida. You're in Flo Ooh. Oh, that's right, because you're on the Harris chain. We are the Harris chain for the Bass Pro Tour Stage 3, and they're catching biggins. I mean, like, you look at Score Tracker, and, like, not many guys have fish. I mean, of course, you're going to have some guys that struggle, but, like, most people's big bass are, like, a six, five to seven. seven eight. I saw yeah. a couple of eights, right? Didn't Fletcher have an eight today? Fletcher had an eight. He's actually out in juniors leading the heavy hitters qualification right now. Oh, Because uh, Fletcher had a small uh, – not a small. He had, like, a four-pounder at Rayburn. Alton had a six at Rayburn, a almost seven at Travis, and now a seven ten at Harris. So my roommate's actually leading the heavy hitters qualification. But yeah, I mean, like everybody's catching <laughs> sixes, sevens. Um, Alton Senior told me yesterday he lost a ten. So I mean, like there's biggins being caught this week. I was watching today, and I watched Alton Senior talking to the guys on their dock, <laughs> and he got his bait stuck like on the rocks, like way up their dock, and. Asked him, to, he just walked as they're gardening, just walks past him to get his bait and stuck, comes back, takes the penalty. Like, <laughs> it was, it was, common. that's hilarious. Yeah, it was that's good. But cool. I totally forgot in our introduction, Andrew, to uh, first we had to give a shout out to Caleb Kufal, who won the elite, uh, elite tournament and second biggest margin of victory with like 17 pounds. And then, uh, obviously, congratulations so far to Bobby Lane, who was over 100 pounds in group B, correct? Tyler, uh -huh. group B, and then and group, group A was uh, Brent, uh, what's his face, Brett Height. It was Brad right. Height. Yeah. Both had over 100 pounds. Yeah, pretty There's, impressive. This chain's showing out right now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, pretty pretty awesome stuff going on, dude. But uh, I think first and foremost uh, for the folks here, uh, obviously tell us a little bit about yourself if anyone lives under a rock and does not know who you are. And then also kind of take, take us way back to when this all started, like when you first created your channel, created your brand, and decided, hey, I want to start you know, recording some of this stuff and kind of get into this little thing, dabble with it. Yeah, well, you know, I used to be slightly offended. Just my pride would kind of be hurt, and I'm, I'm naturally a prideful guy, which I struggle with. But I used to be offended when people didn't know who I was because I was like, oh, I make videos. I'm a YouTuber. But I realized there's a lot of rocks that people can hide under because the fishing industry is so big. So if people haven't heard of my channel, fully understand there's a gajillion YouTube channels out there now. But uh, I was a part of the rise of YouTube fishing back in the like mid you know teens of, of the 2000s so I mean like 2014 15 16 when YouTube fishing was exploding I was a part of that and it was it was so much fun to be like on the cutting edge of, of creating content and going to iCast and having companies laugh at our faces for wanting sponsorships for making videos I mean <laughs> people people had no clue what we were doing and obviously we didn't even know what we we're doing for a while because I didn't know that you could make money on YouTube for like three years of making videos like no one ever no one ever told me that and so it was just like we're all having fun posting videos whatever we want whenever we want there was no structure none of us collaborated with each other until i formed the first collaboration in january of 2016 and after that we started collaborating more and more as youtubers and now you look at it and i mean there's there's got to be a hundred bass fishing channels you know over 50,000 subscribers, if not more than that. So there's there's quite a few, and uh, it, it's helped the industry grow. You know, YouTubers have brought in a whole bunch of, of uh, new fishermen to the industry that pro anglers just can't really connect with. And so I've loved being a part of that over the years. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's it's got to be kind of cool to, like, be the OG class that's kind of <laughs> created this, this niche that no one thought could be a thing in the bass fishing industry where you've kind of, it's almost essentially a revolution where you kind of shown how there's so many different, I guess, niches for people to be coming in the fishing industry that yeah. not many people even thought of. Like you think of, Oh, now it's so saturated. There's no jobs. And then boom, someone comes up with something creative that no one thought of before. There's always a new, you know, niche to find and videos to make. And eventually it gets saturated that it makes it harder. Like I'm not going to say it's as easy to go viral or to, to grow a brand as it used to be, but the, the platform is still there and the rules are still the same, you know? And so there's, I could go on for hours and hours about, you know, YouTube algorithms and such, but if you play by the YouTube rules and you give the platform what it wants, you're going to have success over time. Uh, it's just, people have to realize that it's, it's a long-term game. I've been doing this for eight years, you know, full-time now for two and I'm at 200,000 subscribers 
person. People might think, you know, that that's a lot, or some people might think that's not a lot compared to some other YouTubers, but it just depends on how much time you've put into it. And I'm just now, in my you know opinion, reaching the point where I can put a ton of time into it, and I, I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, I remember when I posted my first YouTube video ever, after a week, it had like eight views, and I had like one subscriber. Yeah. I was like, well, this sucks. Like, I thought I have like 100 subscribers, thousands of views already. <laughs> like, yeah, like that it's easy. But like, no, the YouTube, like that to try and grow that and be consistent with it is I don't think people realize how much time and dedication you have to put into that. And I'm not going to complain. You know, I, I just try not to ever complain about that hour spent editing or whatever, because it's a much better job than sitting behind a desk or at least oh, somebody else's yeah. desk. I sit behind a right. desk all the time, but it's editing videos. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just know that the harder you work and the more time you put in, the, the better chances the algorithm has of rewarding you and the better chances that content blows up and you get more subscribers, which leads to more sponsors. And it's just like a, a snowball and the ball rolls fast and slow throughout times of the year. But, uh, I've just learned that since I love doing this so much, I'm okay with the ball rolling slower sometimes like it did in college. So it can roll faster, you know, now that I'm out of college and, and doing it full time. Yeah. So, dude, I know obviously you were into, you know, high school and into college. You were pretty heavy into tournament bass fishing. And mm -hmm. um, obviously you still have a sense of that being that you're working, you know, with major league fishing. You're traveling yeah. along with that with that tour. Um, so I'm kind of curious, you know, throwing it back to college bass fishing, which many refer to as a stepping stone to yeah. professional level. Back then, was it, what was it for you? Like, did you want to take the YouTube route? Did you want to take the pro route? Or did you want to do what some guys are doing now and combine the two? Well, I mean, I, like I said, I didn't really make much money on YouTube until a few years into it. And so it was really like as I was entering college that I started making any – I mean, like, sure, I'm making money now. But, like, I, I was making peanuts in college on YouTube. And so the tournament scene was what I always wanted to do. I grew up wanting to be a pro bass fisherman and – and early since middle school. And so I just kind of saw college fishing as the next step, like you said, for that. And as soon as I got to college and realized that nobody was documenting college fishing tournaments, I thought, I'm going to do that because I, I documented my high school tournaments and people loved watching those. So I documented college and the series became incredibly successful on my channel. And those videos are still some of my most consistently viewed uh, videos on the channel. And so I eventually realized with some other videos blowing up and like my underwater videos, the Dubassi bluegill has two point whatever, 4 million views. I realized that I could make money by filming whatever I wanted. And the tournament deal was great and all when you caught fish and had a good tournament, but mm -hmm. it just, I, I didn't have fun making tournament videos if it was a rough tournament. And so I, I thought I'm going to give this a try and make more vlogs and make more instructionals and just try a whole bunch of stuff out. And eventually, like I said, the companies in the fishing industry started to take notice and I started to get sponsors and work with people like Luz and, 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 and eventually Skeeter and Yamaha and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, maybe I don't have to do the tournaments. And it was, it was really, uh, you know, when, when Guggen's Guggen squad released their baits and kind of like, you know, started to take over the, the, you know, at least younger audience bait market, I think a lot of companies started to take notice of that and they realized like, Hey, we need to start partnering with YouTubers because if we don't, we're going to get left behind. And it was kind of around that time that a lot of companies started to pay more money and to give more opportunities. And so near the end of college, I was making enough money to support myself and, you know, eventually, you know, a wife. And so I thought, why would I risk, you know, the $40,000 in entry fees and working my way up a, a ladder that I might not ever, you know, reach the top of if I have what I want right now. And, you know, I'm videos I was making three years ago are not the same type of videos I'm making right now. And in three years from now, they might be totally different videos than what I'm making currently. But I've just, you know, figured out that I kind of won the lottery with being this early and working this hard. And so to try to take energy and, you know, met, met both mental and physical energy and put that into tournaments, which I still love, doesn't make sense because it takes away time and energy uh, and brain power from the from the video side of things. So I just had to make a you know a pros and cons list of each side. I physically made one, and I was like, "There's way more pros on the uh, the YouTube side of things." Heck yeah! 
We have a <laughs> message here from Travis. He said, uh, tell Tyler I'm glad I, he got to see me at the ramp yesterday. Good. Hello, Travis. Travis, come see me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's – that's good to do that because I don't think a lot of people take that time, you know, regardless of their career path to kind of reflect and see the pros and cons of, it, of each. And I think if more people did kind of do that, they probably either have a change of, of career path just to see of, you know, do they want to enjoy what they do? I think that's the biggest thing. A lot of people and feel free to disagree either of you or anyone in the comments for that matter is like, why waste any moment of your life? I mean, that's kind of the, the path I've taken the past year is like, why, why waste any of your time hating what you do when you exactly. can take all that effort and energy and put it into something that you enjoy? You might not like make the most money, but if you can you can afford to live off of it, why not love every single day and not work a day in your life? Totally. I agree. Now, of course, there comes, there comes a point in every person's life when you grow up and you have to make enough money to, you know, support yourself. And, and like right. I said, I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to support my, my wife and myself on a, a YouTube and sponsor, you know, income. And hopefully, like I said, the ball keeps rolling and, you know, it, it's never been about the money for me, but when, when it becomes a job, it, it almost has to be to an extent. So like I had several yeah. sponsors drop during COVID and, you know, it was like a bummer, but I still enjoyed making the videos. I still had uh, the same, you know, excitement and enthusiasm for making videos. Uh, but of course, one thing that I, I struggled with early on was like knowing your worth and because no, nobody knew what to pay a YouTuber. And so when, you know, this whole kind of talk is about growing your brand, growing your brand is also growing the awareness of what your brand is worth. And over time, you just in talks with YouTubers and other influencers, you kind of figure out, hey, when you reach this level, you can, you know, ask for this amount of money and this amount of, you know, exposure and, and uh, opportunities. And so I'm never going to, you know, turn down uh, you know, a, a, a great deal um, from somebody, unless of course that I would leave a company that I've worked with for years. I'm never, I'm never going to do that. Um, but you know, in order to support a family, you kind of have to think more about the money side and less about the passion side. Uh, and I've had friends that the money side overcame the passion side and their videos lost quality and people could tell. Um, and then I've had people that the passion side outweighed the money. And when that happens, you start making videos that you're passionate about, but oftentimes that leads to less content, which leads to less money. And so people just can't work a full-time job for the money and do the fishing for the passion. Um, like my, my buddy Walker Wilson, who made videos back in the day, he just didn't like, yeah. he didn't like fishing and filming at the same time. And so that's just, that's his personality. And some guys, they like the filming way too much. And so it, it impedes the fishing. That's kind of my that's kind of my problem. I, I'm I'm on tour right now with Bass Pro Tour. I give up eight weeks of my year to come film this stuff because I love the videography. It's taking away from the YouTube channel. That's just kind of the you know I, I want to put a little bit of passion uh, in what I do, but also still have the the money side of things as well. Right. That was that was that's kind of a really tangent good. tangential answer, but yeah. It's fine. No, you brought me down memory lane, though, because I remember I used to I used to talk to to Walker, and I, I'm gonna have to shoot him a message. I'm gonna have to set myself a reminder to see how yeah. that dude's doing. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, he's he an awesome panel to watch. I graduated. He graduated from Arkansas, whatever, a few weeks ago, and he moved back to Dallas. And him and I are supposed to fish sometime this summer. So, oh, that's same thing. Heck yeah, awesome. Which is, well, obviously, you're, you're at the Harris Chain. Um, you work in Major League Fishing. Um, I remember I was listening to your show you did with Rudd um, and how you're filming. Well, you, you, I think you were the origination of Kings of Bass, correct? I was. Yeah. So Strike King and Lose, I've been with Lose for four or five years. It kind of all runs together at this point. And then Strike King, I signed on uh, November of 2019 is when I signed on with Strike King. And that was when the merger happened between the two companies. And I just thought, you know what? I can... I can give up not fishing with like the four lures that aren't striking that I use all the time. And, uh, and if I do, I just won't put them on camera. And if I can, you know, increase the, the revenue and let it's less to me about increasing revenue. It's about increasing my involvement with a brand. So this is, leads to Kings of Bass. So I wanted to be on tour. I, I loved getting a film, slow motion, B roll, cool stuff of pros launching boats. I always loved seeing that kind of content. 
And I believe that I have a really good eye and mind for telling stories, even, even short little snippets. I think that I can tell a story really well. So I went to them and I said, Hey, can we do this documentary covering the behind the scenes lives of Bass Pro Tours, tour guys? And so they said, yes, let's do it. So we kind of did a test run and uh, sadly only got three, uh, three episodes in due to COVID cutting it short, but it was so much fun. And I did such a good job, I guess, that they decided to take it and do it for themselves this year. Uh, but they, cause they, in, in company mergers, they had uh, uh, a new media team brought in full-time media team in house. So they're doing Kings of Bass now in house, still a great show. I still love to, uh, you know, give input and be involved where I can, but uh, they wanted to keep me on tour now just producing social media content. So now it's even better for me, honestly, because with the Kings of Bass, I would film for the entire event, so much footage, you know, terabytes of footage. I'd go home and I would spend like a solid week in front of my computer editing this thing. And it came out like a masterpiece and I loved it. But now I get to go to take off at 530, pick one Strike King Pro and one Lose Pro, film Instagram story content from one minute to two minute long, crank out the edits by 10 in the morning or 11 in the morning, and then I'm done. So it gives me time in the afternoon to fish if I want to, or just, you know, travel, or I can go on the water and take photos out there. And so it's a lot more um, kind of like in your brain and out of your brain. I'm not thinking about the, the developmental storyline. I'm just telling a quick thing of how they're feeling, you know, cool shots for the morning and maybe at the end of the day, how their day went, that kind of thing. So they strike King and lose got sick of the traditional phone uh, updates that you see on tour that most, most guys just say, like, Hey guys, uh, you know, Kevin Van Dam here, you know, we're at Bass Pro tour and they just kind of got sick of that kind of content. So they wanted me to make that general vibe, but make it way more highly produced and fun to engage with and watch. And I've had a ton of fun doing it. I'm, I'm kind of like the, the strike King and lose host of their social medias during the tour events. And I get to travel cool. with out in the mountain and just kind of pick their brains on fishing all the time. Uh, out in junior is one of his friends and out in senior is one of my like, you know, family, what's, what's what I'm looking it for? It basically like a, call him like a second dad. Yeah. Like a second dad. And, and so it's just, it's a ton of fun. As a matter of fact, he's just walked in the door right now. Or just junior, junior did say hi, junior. Hello. Hello. <laughs> awesome. He's, he's fishing the knockout round tomorrow. So hopefully he does well, but yeah, it's just a ton of fun just to get a, a bunch of content out. Like I think every event I probably edit like 19 to 25 videos which, you know, seems like a lot, but if you're doing two a day and you're three or four a day, just you, you knock them out pretty quick. And um, Especially at one to two minutes each, it probably exactly. goes pretty quick. It does. And so it's really helped me to edit that kind of stuff because that trans translates uh, into my channel and learning how to edit my little, you know, B-roll sequences faster and the social media promos for my videos, I can edit those faster now. So I just love doing everything I can to help Strike King and Lose because the deeper I can get with those companies, the, the more financially secure I am as a brand. And that's, of course, as a, having a wife and, you know, hopefully kids in the future. Sure, I could go off and have no sponsors and I could use whatever baits, whatever rods, reels I wanted. Uh, and maybe that would work for me. But as of right now, like I consider Tyler's Real Fishing a business. It's not LLC, but it's a, so don't sue me, people out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, the I consider it a business for sure, and so I have to make audited. I have to make a uh, not yet. I'm really I have a really good CPA, but uh, I have to make business decisions, and so I'm going to choose to work with companies. And it's great because the companies I choose to work with, I believe in. You know, it would be different if I. We were just choosing companies that, you know, had horrible products, but they were just paying me a lot of money. But I, I refuse to do that. And luckily, I'm at a point where I can choose who I want to work with. So it just, it's just really cool. Yeah. Thank you, dude. I mean, and you, you bring up the two, like the part of doing a really good job about it and obviously helps you be more financially secure. But that's almost like essentially a way of giving yourself job security. You know, yes, like the, yes. the better you do, the more important and more you know, more than that company that you're working with needs you and they see where you come in, you fill the mm -hmm. gap and obviously bring more attention to their brand and improve. Yeah. So heck exactly. Yeah. And I'm doing the same thing with Yamaha, a thing called Yamaha Boating Academy. 
or I'm the host of a uh, video series teaching new boaters how to be safe and effective and, and have fun on the water. So it goes covers all topics from boat launching and you know boating knots and how to properly drive your boat and uh, a lot of things that older people that you know might get a boat for their kids. They never went through a boater safety license because you don't need one if you have a driver's license in most states. So that's another way that I'm getting entrenched in the, the Skeeter and Yamaha world. And uh, I love shooting content and being available for power pole for photo shoots because the more I can get deeper with power pole, the better that relationship is. And this is not like, I mean, it, it's a two-way street. So of course, as, as an influencer and in, in a, a, it's my job, I want to get something, but I also want to help the companies I work with be even better because the better they are, the more successful they are, the more secure everybody is. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I love aligning with, with great companies because I believe I have the skills, knowledge and, and experience to help them grow whatever way they want to. And they have the resources and the opportunities to help me grow as well. So really, I mean, networking is the biggest thing. For, for anybody out there that wants to start a channel and wants to get into videography, um, go to the classic, go to iCast, go to, you know, your local, not your local tackle shop, but just like any local events and try to network with people, uh, not to get anything right away, but just to meet people and, and have them see your face. That's the, that's the most effective way to grow any kind of brand in the fishing industry. Heck yeah, uh, that's a great tip. Just the more people you can meet, the better. Yeah, uh, exactly. Obviously, I think it's important to kind of in stride with that kind of say, like, if you're going and planning on growing a brand and meeting a lot of people, it is very important to remember the persona that you're putting off and know that any negative, any negative experience that someone might have with you, they're, they're going to tell other people about. So it's very important if you create your brand, you need to create it in a positive light and just know that things do reflect back on you. Yes. Uh, so I, I think that's one thing. And I think that you've handled and done a great job with is keeping your, your persona in a positive light. Um, and and I, I, yeah, I, hope so. I, I hope so. And I hope that's, that's seen. Yeah. <laughs> we have, so we have a, we had a quick question here from Victor Hernandez. Um, and I want to make this so people can see it here. Uh, and he's asking you, Tyler, if you do a video of fishing the striking Ocho tips and tricks. So I went and added while you were chatting here, I muted myself and I added uh, your video of the top five ways to fish a Senko tips and tricks. So I added that down there for folks who might have. I don't even seen. remember making that video. When, when did I make that video? It was June 7, 2017. Oh, now I remember that video. Yes. It's still a I think You might have had more, but that's the first one that came up in the search. Yeah, I, I feel <laughs> like when it comes to Senko fishing, there's really no do wrongs. It's just. What are you confident in fishing? Yeah. <laughs> like you can get on five different boats and three guys will throw a Texas rigged and two will throw wacky or vice versa. Yeah. So <laughs> just exactly. so you, you mentioned with networking, obviously growing your brand uh, and being very important to create, you know, obviously fostering your brand. Uh, we actually have a, a buddy of ours here, Simon Morgan, who's asking, what did you start with when you, oh, I'm assuming when you first started out, what was it a basic GoPro? Uh, what do you use now for getting best video content editing wise for someone attempting to yeah. use? Well, the, 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 you know, the phrase or the, the saying goes that it's, it's not the arrow, it's the Indian. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, I might not be politically correct. I don't know, whatever. Um, you know, it's not, it's not the, it's not the tool. It's the, it's the carpenter. So like it's, you can give someone a, you know, red weapon camera, which is a $40,000, $80,000 camera, whatever the, the weapon comes in at. Uh, they're not going to know how to use it. They will not be able to get good shots. They don't have the, the eye for it, the experience. And so could I make what I make right now with just a GoPro? I could. You know, I'd lose a little bit of the, of the high quality-ness. That's a word. But, <laughs> yeah, I started with just a GoPro. And I had just a GoPro for – a long time. And the first camera I got that had interchangeable lenses, it only shot 1080p, like 60 frames, which was the fastest frame rate it had. And that was great because I could film a little bit of slow-mo and I could like, you know, pull, you know, in and out of focus. And that was great. And the more I got into the videography world, the more that I, you know, used the money that was coming in for more camera gear. And now I've got some of the best freelance, you know, drones and, 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 and you know, DSLR cameras out there. Uh, but you cannot expect to create good videos with, uh, r I guess, good videos right away. I would say you start with small equipment 
and work your way up. And I have a video, a, a series, a two part video series on my channel. Just search on YouTube, Tyler's Real Fishing video or video editing. I got one that's how to make a video and one that's how to edit a video on the channel. Oh, so yeah, awesome. if you'll find those two links. The how to make a video is much older than the how to edit. <laughs> Awesome. I will, uh, I'll add that here into, actually I'll search that and add that into the chat for folks who are looking for an easy link to get to there. The biggest uh, thing though, is if, if Simon's still listening and any other people that want to make uh, what you call it, YouTube videos, audio is so much more important than video. I could have, like I said, you know, 8k footage and slow motion or whatever, but if my audio had wind noise and it was, it was popping and you know, just, it was unpleasant to listen to, people leave the video. I don't care how good the quality is. And so I spent so much time buying pieces off Amazon and Chinese websites to plug in my <laughs> GoPro to make, you know, the best possible editing, uh, not editing, uh, uh, audio situation. And that's worth it. It's weight in gold to me. I could, I could do what I do with, without any sort of nice cameras, just GoPros, but I could not do what I do without lavalier mics and nice shotgun mics and that kind of thing. Audio is crucial for a video. Yeah, I think that's Andrew and I's next investment in shotgun mics. Cause that's something, cause obviously we're trying to make some videos here, some content, you know, some educational content while on the water. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that we've talked about is audio is probably our biggest gap at this point. Um, but we have one other one here from Charles Blood and he says, I might've missed what's uh, this answer, but what's better when first starting out, is it video quality or posting multiple videos? So quantity or quality. So the algorithm is always changing uh, in terms of in terms of what it it uh, rewards. It you it went through a season where it was tons of content. I don't quite think it's that anymore. Um, from everything I've read and, and, and YouTube mentors that I know, uh, videos and channels can blow up from one video. Yeah. You don't have to be posting a whole lot. Now, posting more gives you an opportunity, more opportunities to hit that sweet spot and get to go viral. But uh, I would say recommend, I would recommend posting just content that you're happy with and, and you think serves your audience. Uh, I think a lot of fishing channels and, and mine included in the past, we made the mistake of throwing everything at the wall, vlogs, tournament coverage, underwater, this, this, this. And I grew a lot of subscribers from all those videos. The problem with it, and I'll admit this, is that people that subscribe for underwater you know, footage, if I don't post those videos, they're not going to watch the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm getting right. some audio feedback, by the way, from somebody. Hello? There we go. We're good. It was getting, I was getting feedback. You're hearing it now? Yes. Hold on. That's so weird. Hello? Is is that hearing now? Is is hearing? Yeah, I'm here now. I'm still hearing it, Andrew. I think it's coming from I think it's coming from Billy. Come from me? All right. Let's see you have, if it do you have headphones. Sorry, I didn't mean to like interrupt the podcast. No, you're having, good. You're I'm good. having trouble talking because I can hear myself repeat. No, you're fine. Um let me mute myself and then tell me if you if you're still hearing it when Andrew talks. Okay. So here. going along the lines of the YouTube like story in posting an algorithm and stuff would you say it's better to post like a series of videos at a time or kind of focus on like a subject so be like i'm going to talk rods and reels for a week or a month and then go into the next thing and the next thing or just do a series of fishing videos breaking it down per season or whatnot i mean it's definitely beneficial to do all of the above and actually and in, in, in if we're talking about the audio for a second i can't hear the uh the repeat now so it is you bailey that's the uh, the issue <laughs> but yeah, i don't hear it anymore either from from what uh what i've learned is that but you, you take tactical bass in for an example they are the most successful instructional bass fishing channel on the planet and they're kind of my my mentors i've talked with them for years they're good buddies of mine and they are benefiting right now from having a catalog of content. I'm talking like six plus years of content that is all the same. They don't have tournament videos. They don't have, I mean, even their underwater videos are instructional. They don't have any, any vlogs. They hardly have any just like catching fish. They have no B-roll. They've been doing the same thing for years and it works because people know what to expect. 
whether you're a brand new fan or you're an old fan of, of their channel, you can find the same quality of video. Maybe the quality has stepped up a little bit, but the same type of video and, and, and content that they made four years ago. So somebody that discovers their channel now has four to six years of videos to go back and watch. And my channel is now starting to benefit from that as well. Now I have a year and a half to two, two years of instructional videos for folks to go back and watch. And I have what has to be tens of thousands of subscribers that are from the underwater videos that don't watch the instructional videos. I mean, and, and if they are, they're starting to slowly migrate, but just because they subscribe for one thing and are not getting the satisfaction of that content going forward. Same with the tournament coverage. Uh, you see a, a spike in my tournament video views because high school, college, you, you know, guys fishing Toyota series, whatever that are fans of mine, they just watch the tournament coverage because that is what appeals to them the most. So that's why I made the decision to just do, for the most part, instructional content because I saw that it worked for Tactical Bass and I've seen that theme work for other channels out there. It doesn't seem like variety channels do very well on YouTube. And I see so many young fishing channels out there and you know, one comes to mind right away. I'm not gonna name who it is, but they're finding a little bit of success, but I don't think it's gonna be long-term because they are, they're, they're, they're broadening the type of content they make. And I just don't think that's smart because I thought that for so many years, but in making many mistakes and, and doing this for eight years, I've realized that like YouTube loves consistency and if you can provide your audience with the same type of content all the time, preferably the same times of the week, that's not always easy to do. But uh, if you can do that, then you're going to find success. That's a great tip. Cause I, I've heard that as well is like when you have a, you know, when you're trying to post videos and you say you post an instructional, then you post a pond hopping video and then you post a tournament video, yep. but YouTube kind of tries to take you in all directions rather than driving all of your focus into one. So you're exactly. not really maximizing on anything. You're just getting a little bit of each mm -hmm. direction. And it's possible if I was supposed to Barbie rod backflip into Walmart challenge, you know, I, I'd get some views and I might get some subscribers from that. But would those subscribers mm -hmm. translate into actual like active audience members? I, I don't think so. Right. And that's, that's why collaboration is big, but only collaboration with people that their audience at least shares something in common with you. So like mm. the two collaborations that I've done this year um, are with Paul Macbeth, who's the, the five-time world champion disc golfer and a channel called The Modern Rogue. And I, I collaborated with Paul just because I'm a huge fan of him and, and I love disc golf. But turns out his audience is tuning in because they want to learn how to play disc golf better. And the disc golf and fishing communities, I, I'd love to talk about this if we get into it, are incredibly intertwined. I mean, people that, that, that fish oftentimes at least enjoy playing disc golf and vice versa. And so I got at least 1,000 subscribers or so from Paul's channel, which is great. And they, they keep asking me to make more disc golf content, which I'm not going to do, um, at least on, on YouTube. Um, but uh, the, the Modern Rogue, they're a channel about – just doing cool, you know, manly, nerdy, whatever, just guy things and showing people the experience of how to do that. And so I love showing people how to catch more fish. So I went on their channel. Uh, I taught them how to catch bass. They both caught their personal best and people were like, hey, I never thought bass fishing could be fun, but this guy's channel has helped with that. So like, if I'm to collaborate with another fishing channel that makes challenges and vlogs, you might think that collaboration would do something, but in, in my experience, it, it just doesn't because the, the audience is looking for something different. They're, right. they're, the, they're looking to be entertained. The people on those other two channels that I mentioned, even if they're not fishermen, they're looking to learn. And so right. that's, that's really the mindset I'm taking with collaborations. Am I going to turn down fishing with somebody? No, it's just, it's not going to be a huge uh, emphasis going forward for me for collaborations. It's going to be mostly about teaching. Right. Yeah, I have, <laughs> it's funny, I have that disc golf um, written here in uh, the Frisbee golf in my notes here. Uh, Cause I remember oh, you, I remember listening to you chat about it on, uh, on Rudd's show, but uh, real fast, John King has another comment for you, Tyler. And he says, next time you get to work with Mark Menendez, ask him about his short stint in the band Menudo. He was kicked out of the boy band early for is provocative gyrations when dancing. True story. <laughs> I, I, have, I have not heard that. <laughs> I'm going to take, take a picture of this, though. 
There so, you go. I, I'm pretty sure John has like all the backdrop on like every pro anchor <laughs> in the world because he always has a comment about someone and it's hilarious. That's funny. Now, sadly, I do not work with Mark Menendez. Uh, he's on the Bassmaster Elite Series and I work on the Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour, but I will see Mark at the Classic. So I will ask him at the Classic for sure. Yeah, I think he was. I think he was pertaining to to like the strike king because Mark's was strike king. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah, but John John likes to make a lot of <laughs> funny comments. John is actually a very talented. Real, real small tangent. John is a very talented individual. Very generous individual. Um, he actually created the small mouth here for me. Um, he's he's very talented. He's actually called Drunk Wood. So my imagine my theory behind all of his knowledge of these anglers is he gets them drunk. And therefore, that's why he has all this knowledge and information on anchors. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. We got a few more comments I saw here. Oh, we got a bunch coming through. Oh, um, we have one asking from uh, Bass Kayak and Beers. And he said, this is an interesting one. Um, he said, what are your thoughts on content creators that focus on instigating clickbaits to grow their audience? Well, the that that's great and all. And I used to... You know, there, there's been progressions of like, you know, things I was uncomfortable doing. So like I was uncomfortable, you know, capitalizing words in my title and putting like exclamation points because I thought like that's too sensationalistic. Nobody wants to click on something that's obviously like click me. But eventually that became like mainstay. Everybody put, Bad. you know, it, now oftentimes I'll capitalize every word in the title. And it's just like because you have to keep up with the times. I used to hate putting like you know, arrows in the thumbnail and outlining things, but eventually that started to work. And so you'd be left behind if you didn't do it. So I understand the clickbait thing. The problem is there's two twofold problem with that. The first is that uh, YouTube hates that. So like the, one of the, the biggest metrics they judge right now on their algorithm is uh, like cl click through rate to engagement watch time. So if they see your video is getting a ton of click throughs, but the people that watch it are like taking a nosedive right away. Like nobody's watching it for very long. They're obviously going to see a pattern there. And especially if your channel continues to do that, they're going to, I don't know if you want to call it like, you know, blacklist or whatever, but like they're, they're, they're not going to promote your content as much. Um, especially if, if early on when the video releases, it starts to show that type of behavior. They just don't want that because they want people to stay on the platform. So if you can have crazy high watch time, like Dude Perfect or um, uh, Mark Rober or a bunch of other like you know older, more established channels, PewDiePie, uh, their watch times are through the roof. And so YouTube loves to promote channels that are like that. And so right. clickbait works. The second two, the second problem there, uh, first being YouTube doesn't like it, is that again you have to be consistent with your content. So like you're gonna have to consistently clickbait people. And that's just hard to do. I mean, it's it is hard to be, you know, possible murder weapon. Cops called, almost died every time because eventually, <laughs> eventually the, the boy cries wolf too many times. And you can you can only die nine times, you know. Almost arrested. <laughs> and, and so I don't think, I don't think I've ever used cops called. I've also I don't usually you know do things to make the cops get called on me, and I've never <laughs> tried a murder weapon. But, Isn't uh, it ironic? <laughs> the best yeah. one I've the best one I've ever seen was I can't remember the main title because this took away from the entire thing, but it was in parentheses, did I survive? And he's like in the thumbnail. I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I think I've ever seen. And yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, of course I have a, I have a I have a personal, you know, just like problem when people say like almost died and I watch the video like expecting to see like <laughs> them like bleeding out and like someone does CPR on them like when they're filming <laughs> and they like they take their boat through like three foot waves and I'm like like yeah like it's dangerous you don't know what you're doing but like you didn't almost die <laughs> no not even um, close <laughs> but then again like that doesn't affect my life so I'm right. not gonna I'm not gonna worry about that it's just that uh, like I said you can only die so many times <laughs> <laughs> This is a great point. <laughs> yeah. So real quick, we have more viewer questions in, but real fast, I have a question for you. And it's, yeah. you know, obviously you've done a great job, but not honest, I was, excuse me, I can't talk, creating your brand and then obviously fostering it. Was there something that you did extracurricular to obviously gain that knowledge in doing it or did it kind of come naturally? I've always been an entrepreneur of sorts. 
I, you know, my dad always would make me like every, every dad should at least be outside with him and, you know, fix things and mow the lawn or whatever. And, and I love being outside. And so I didn't mind it. And so when they, he put me in boy scouts and I was like really flying through it and doing well. And so I don't know when the conversation happened, but I said, or he said, or somebody was like, Hey, you know, how about doing yard work? So from the time I was like 11 to 17, I had, you know, clients all around the neighborhood and I was mowing lawns and laying out mulch. And eventually when I had my license, um, from a truck that I bought in cash for $10,000 of all my own money that I saved up. I never bought anything. I never spent it. I never, you know, went to the, went to the toy store. I always saved up for my truck. So as soon as I got that truck, I could buy, I could get, I use my dad's flatbed and power wash people's driveways. And I just, I've always loved working and being productive. I hate sitting in and watching Netflix. I mean, it's fun with the wife, you know, now and again, but I just can't sit still for that long. <laughs> and so I've also totally lost the question you asked me. <laughs> it was just, it was more of, did you do anything extracurricular? Oh, to, yeah. Yeah, 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 I gotcha. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> when, when it, when it came to, uh, I'm having trouble. Link I had a link to this in my head. Um, <laughs> Man, Dude, we're, we're, we're in the same boat. It happens to both I realized of us all that the time. I didn't even come close to answering your question. So, <laughs> so let me tell you how I started when I was a young lad. <laughs> so he was angry that I, my friends. Yes. So, but like, one sec, I have a way. Um, I guess it always it, it always worked its way out to like when with videography, I wanted to go hang out with videographer friends of mine that didn't even fish, but like could teach me things about how to you know, do make videos better and edit better. And so I took, you know, editing classes with some buddies of mine. And I guess that's kind of the extracurricular stuff. Um, I, you know, when it comes to now doing instructional videos, I love watching Wired to Fish and, and Bass University and just really soaking in all the information I can. I've read every Bassmaster magazine I've ever gotten. And so, you know, now that I get to travel on the Bass Pro Tour, I can kind of consider this extracurricular because sure, I make money from filming, but I get to talk with pros and pick their brains on like exactly what they're doing. That's why traveling with the Outlands is great because they're telling me like exactly what's going on in their heads and what works and what doesn't. And, you know, by per the information rules, I just kind of have to sit back and be like, Hmm, interesting. So there's, there's been so many times when like I watch MLF live and I see angler doing X, Y, Z. And one of my roommates is like, I bet they're doing this. And I have to think to myself, like they're not, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But I just I think it, it benefits whatever you're doing, whether it's videography or, or, or fishing tournaments or whatever, it, whatever it benefits you to like grow your mind in every way possible. And that's what I loved to do. You know, when I was in college, I loved to uh, just be involved in organizations and, and, and you know, I, I love the college experience. I think it, I think college benefited my brand and my, you know, persona and personality a lot more than my education. And then it did my education. Uh, education was great and all, but I, I, I didn't go to college to get a degree in communications. I went to college to get, you know, the character building and, you know, living with four of my best friends. Just, I think a lot of, a lot of things I did outside of fishing has led me to have the successful brand that I have now. So now we turned it back around. Yeah, no, it's, and that was actually something I've been kind of thinking about a lot because I listened to, and you, so you bring up college. I've been listening to Bass Talk Live, and they've been on the discussion in the past few episodes of college bass fishing and getting a degree and guys leaving college early to try to go pro. What is your take on the whole college bass fishing being a step in, stepping stone for anglers? Um, and maybe, I don't know, I kinda, I want, I'm curious to hear your spin on it because I have a few takes, and I, I can't really land on one, um, but I, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. I think it's a stepping stone for lazy anglers. Mm. And let me explain what I mean by that. So uh, unless you are like really smart. So like my, my partner Garrison, he had, if I believe right, a full ride to AM because he's a genius. So like at that point, going to college is not harmful to you at all. There's just benefits because there's no student loans. There's no whatever. But I know a lot of kids, especially in fishing communities, don't usually grow up with a lot of money. And I'm again, stereotyping anglers, but they're usually not geniuses, you know, like math, <laughs> science, that kind of thing. And yeah. in, in, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not. 
And oh, so no. you're speaking I didn't with the get, same two guys. Up I here. didn't get scholarships for very much in college. And so I, I mean, you know, eventually I started making enough YouTube money that I could pay for college. And I, so I did. Um, and my parents helped me out a little bit in the first two years of college. But I think a lot of anglers see college fishing as a stepping stone. And so they kind of accept the college price tag because they get the benefit of fishing tournaments. But the problem is the only way to really advance is winning the bracket. And oftentimes the most talented angler doesn't, doesn't even win the bracket. It, 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 it's, it's sometimes luck of the draw uh, based on who you get paired against. And if you catch enough fish in the championship now, of course, some really dang good anglers have won the bracket, but right. that's really the only way to actually reach that final stepping stone. But the other thing that, that's great about college fishing is that you get to meet uh, sponsors in the industry. The problem with that is that the people that come to the tournaments are not decision makers. So most of the time, the people that come from Hummingbird and, and, and Abu Garcia, whatever, they're just a lower level person that doesn't have the decision making uh, power to get you any kind of sponsorship or move any, move any needles. And so that's why I say it's for the lazy person, because if you have drive, you cannot go to college, get a job in the trades, or you maybe go to a trade school, whatever. I'm a huge proponent of trades. If I didn't have YouTube, I think that's where I would have ended up eventually. Um, because the possibility of making more money and making your own schedule, being a plumber and a auto tech or a welder, HVAC, HVAC whatever, uh, you can make more money right away. Don't have to take out, I know guys that take out loans for their entry fees. You don't have to do that because you can take off some time from work and go fish. And if you just take off a few days a year to go to the classic and, and work your way into ICAST, you can meet the people that you need to meet instead of going to a four year college and paying a whole bunch of money to maybe meet somebody that's lower level at one of these companies. So mm -hmm. I think I think the, the the true smart people, the ones that go into the trades, uh, of some of some variety uh and then work their way up the system from the opens or the coasters or the toyota series whatever uh mm -hmm. and actually work to get to know the right people instead of hoping that it's handed to them because they fished in college i don't think fishing in college holds that much weight to be honest there's a lot of really good anglers that fished in college um that are now on the pro circuits but there's also a lot of people that are coming up that decided not to go to college and I think it's it's just more emblematic of our culture in general that everybody feels like they have to go to college. And I'm just, I'm not into that for sure. I'm so happy you said that because, and I've mentioned it before, it's like everything they're pushing now or, or have been pushing is college, college, college. And I think if anything that the COVID year has taught us is how important going to a trade school is and can mm -hmm. be. I mean, you look at the demand for it. And especially if you're just trying to fish professionally and that's your main goal, why would you go to college and put yourself in debt when you can just go to a trade, a trade school, maybe for what, three months max, and you're making money right off the bat with yeah. no debt, and it's more money you'll have to put towards fishing. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody yeah. down there said college bass fishing. Look at the success of Casey. Casey's an interesting, an interesting case because he won the first ever championship when there was like seven teams, and they didn't even have any money in it. They gave him a paint kit, and he hand-painted his own crankbait. So that's that's just a cool – story in general but you look at a lot of other college fishermen that haven't gone anywhere and i fished against some really really good anglers and i'm not saying they would have gone pro if they had skipped out on college but now they're working some low-paying job and they have no time to fish and so i think if you want to have time to fish go to the trades I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep saying it man i think it's really really beneficial or or even start your own business become like a landscaper or totally, totally. Mason. Yeah, like that's still trade. So like, yeah. 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 I mean, you look at the Jordan Lees and, 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 you know, other people that have done really well in college, but then again, they had to qualify from the open just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the sponsors they got, a lot of them are not even with those current, they're those same college sponsors that give you for that year after winning the bracket. A lot of those guys aren't even with those companies anymore. So I don't think it really helps you all that much. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we have a couple more viewer questions here, and then we'll wrap things up um, with a fun question at the end. Um, here we have the Lewis Chronicles. Mr. Brandon Lewis, a local guy here in New York, is asking, back when you fished tournaments and recorded a whole eight hours of fishing, was there a way that you efficiently went through footage? It's a good question. 
No. <laughs> no, I, I've never – well, first off, I used GoPro Hero 4s, and I still do uh, for a long time. I've got a 6, 7, 8, whatever, 9 now. But uh, I don't trust looping mode because I've had way – I've heard way too many stories of people losing footage in looping mode. And that's a great and all, but to use that when it goes bad, there's no coming back from that. So I prefer to get a big SD card that's, that's high quality and just record everything and buy four hard drives a year and just bite the bullet there and get more hard drives. I've got raw footage from 2016 on a hard drive. Like my, my first year I made videos. And so I just, is there a reason to keep it? Maybe, maybe not. It's kind of maybe good to have, you know, to look back at later on, but mm -hmm. I think it's better to record everything. And then when it comes to editing it, uh, I learned how to use audio waveforms. I talk about it in my, how to edit fishing videos video on my channel uh, that Bailey, you know, you guys linked somewhere in here. And uh, yeah. instead of trying to scrub when you're editing, scrub through the footage and look for fish catches, I just switch the audio waveforms up. So whenever the audio jumps, either I talked there or I caught a fish there, which obviously I'm talking when I catch a fish. So that's how I find uh, fish catches relatively quickly. And then I've done this as long as I can remember. And I'm, I'm hoping more people do this as well. I stop my clips and restart them after anything happens. So after a mm -hmm. fish catch, after I lose a fish, after I give a short little tip, after I fart, I mean like a anything <laughs> that anything that could belong in the video that I think is beneficial, I'm going to clip that and restart it. So so many times my buddies that I fish with know if they get a backlash or they say something funny, I'm immediately going to stop and restart and they're like, "Come on, man, don't put that in the video." And whether I do or not, I just I know that at the end of every clip, there's probably something valuable, um, yeah. and it it just becomes second nature. Something happens, I restart the clip. Heck yeah! Let's see our next question here from Kyle Pillars, which Andrew I think is coffee worthy. Uh, a question called coffee worthy question here, and I know it's a yeah. loaded question. I know this is a question that could be for an entire episode. Um, and it's it's how did you approach talking with companies that were interested in sponsorship? especially companies that you might've been hesitant on their products or what they can offer you. I've got a whole video on this. If you search Tyler's real fishing sponsors on YouTube, you'll find the video and I made it. What has to be like, like 2016, four, right? Four years I ago. And it was right after you signed with lose. I think it was. Yes. And I remember that video. I've probably got to remake it because people are still asking about the topic and, and I've probably got more beneficial information now, but I still think everything I said in that video holds true. And uh, it's funny in that video, I said like, Hey Skeeter, if you want to sponsor me, let me know. And now I'm sponsored by Skeeter, which is pretty cool. But uh, the biggest thing is, is providing a value that the company has used for. So if the company has a bunch of photographers, they probably don't need another photographer, but do they need somebody to write things? Do they need somebody to, you know, help design product? Do they need somebody to test product. Like there's, there's lots of things companies could have a use for. And oftentimes it's just like being present and, being a helping hand and showing up. That's, that's what helped me out secure my deal with PowerPole is that whenever they needed somebody for a photo shoot in Texas, when I was in college or, or at the classic or to be a camera boat driver, I showed up and I helped. And it was like, yeah, I wasn't getting paid for it. And uh, it was just kind of like working, doing the hard grunt work. But eventually a company sees that you're, you're doing it because you love the company and they want to work with you. But there's no overnight success story for sponsors. There's just not. Like I've been working at this eight years. At this point, I can walk into any company I want at iCast and, and try to you know get a deal worked out. But even two years ago, that wasn't a possibility. And so your reputation is your resume. You know, in college, did they make you make resumes? I, I made them and then I threw them away because like it has no use for, to me. Like my reputation is my resume. And so the things that I've done and the ways that I've interacted with companies and the ways that I've served them and helped them, that is what allows me to continue to have success in the industry. Like I, I, I heard somebody at the Bass Pro Tour come up and talk to Jordan Lee yesterday. I was, you know, walking by his boat and they asked him like, how should I get sponsors? And he just kind of let the cat out of the bag and he said, there's just so many anglers nowadays that you really have to like differentiate yourself in some way. And that's mm -hmm. true. Like the way that I differentiated myself was that I'm going to be a family friendly, um, you know, I live my life by Christian values. So like that's going to be present on my channel. Uh, if you like it, awesome. I'll work with you. If you don't like it, 
that's cool. You know, we can, we can part ways. And I have never found a company that doesn't want to work with somebody who's clean cut. And I have met plenty of companies that don't want to work with somebody who's not clean cut. So that's just kind of been the, you know, the easy decision I've made is that like, I'm not going to cuss in my videos. I'm not going to, you know, smoke or, or, or put in you know, the women in the thumbnails, whatever. Um, because I, I want a, lo a long career in this industry. And so whether you're tournament fishing or, or making videos, there's always things you can do to help the companies out. And I'm not going to, like I said, it's not going to take place overnight. You're not just going to ask a company, Hey, you know, can I do this for you in exchange for this? Because they probably get so many messages about that right now, but it's always worth asking and being involved. And eventually you'll meet the right person. They'll give you an opportunity and the snowball that'll be very small. will start rolling. And uh, as long as you don't burn bridges and if you have to leave a company, leave it respectfully and, and with, with a good reason for why I haven't had to leave many companies, but the ones I did uh, either the relationship, you know, turned sour on their end, or uh, I was just offered something that I, I couldn't turn down in terms of like a future career sort of thing. Uh, but it's just really all about showing people respect and they will show you that respect in return. That's a really good way to answer that. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's a copy question for sure. Oh yeah. 1000%. Uh, Kyle, uh, make sure you do we, Andrew, do we have Kyle's information yet? I don't think Kyle's won yet. I know Kyle, you've been on the show a bunch. I think it's the, obviously that coffee's due because uh, you've been active in a whole bunch of shows, but obviously get us your contact information and we'll get you uh, obviously that coffee sent out. Um, our last viewer question, Tyler, and then we're going to hit you with our fun question is from Warren Beard. He's going deep with it asking, where do you see yourself in 10 years? <sighs> you know, like I, I really hesitate to make long-term plans. Um, I see myself, you know, catching fish still. Do I see myself making three YouTube videos a week and, and teaching people how to catch fish and being on tour and filming? No, I, I don't think in 10 years I'll still be doing that exact same thing that I'm doing now. Um, <clears throat> one, because hopefully I'll have kids in 10 years and um, that'll have to take priority over certain things. And even getting married has kind of shifted priorities. So I've had to learn how to be married and still make videos and, and do the freelance thing. And it's just a, as life changes, you have to make those adjustments, uh, push out the things that are, that are time wasters and, and don't benefit your life or at least what you want and, and allow those other things to take the place of that time. And so I honestly have no clue. I would love to do more music. You know, I would love to do more mentoring for both fishermen and both in, in spiritual stuff with my church. I, I would love to, uh, with music do more worship leading it's just with with how deep i am into fishing right now and how well it's 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 compensating my life i am really having a blast right now and so i don't want to change what i'm doing right now but in 10 years it could look totally different so i don't have like a i don't have a five-year goal where i want to be at <laughs> five hundred thousand subscribers and then a million subscribers by 10 years like i don't have a a long-term goal like that um i just have i guess in 10 years, I still want to um, be the best husband I can be and hopefully the best father I can be eventually. Um, if I'm working with companies, I want to be the best representative for them I can be. And as always, I want to be the best representative of Jesus Christ that I can be. And so those are the four things I think that in 10 years, uh, if I look back and I'm, and I'm not fulfilled those, I will be severely disappointed. So that's, that's where I want to be in 10 years. Heck yeah, dude. Spoke, spoken greatly. And uh, obviously something that people can take note on. Um, but dude, our last, uh, our last fun question for you before we let you go here. Um, usually we, I, I change things up a little bit. We're going to, we're going to play around with our fun questions here uh, per episode, but um, you get one technique, one lake of your choice and one person to choose besides your wife. I don't want to make that, make you have that decision, <laughs> but the one lake, one technique, one person to fish with for the rest of your life. What are you choosing? Okay. Um, man. See, I've got so many fishing buddies that I, that I love spending time with. I just, I don't know if I can choose one of them. All right, how about this? What about not a buddy? What about someone that maybe an idol or someone you've never met that you love to fish with? 
I mean, that was Clay Dyer, and I fished with him, and it was awesome. So that is pretty awesome. Um, hmm. And I've and I've gotten to hang out with KVD and Edwin Evers and Otto So like a lot of my you know heroes and men that are mentors now and good buddies. So I, I don't exactly have an answer to the person question. Um, I would always love to you know I don't know take you know movie stars or musicians or whatever out fishing that that that's kind of a dream of mine to just continue to network outside of fishing in that sense but i don't have an answer there uh technique man probably punching so i would i would like to i would like to punch the rest of my life and obviously i have to go to what you call it um a lake that has grass so <laughs> like the uh, Kel Delta, we'll, we'll, we'll take Rayburn off the table. Cause you're from Texas. So I hate, like... I hate Rayburn. Rayburn's a trash lake. It really <laughs> is. I, I, I feel so bad for people that I meet when I'm at Rayburn tournaments that are like, yeah, man, we drove in from like, you know, Connecticut to fish this legendary lake. And I asked them how they're doing. And they're like, Oh, it's, it's tough this week. And I'm like, yeah, it's tough all the time. Like Rayburn, <laughs> you could go 45 minutes North to Lake, you know, Nak Nakanish or Nakadoshis and have way better success. They're just, there's Rayburn is, is over, overhyped for sure. You can't, you can't catch a 45 pound bag anywhere else than you can at Rayburn. But also nobody rarely does that only the offshore hammers. But uh, I'd say my favorite lake, for punching doesn't actually exist anymore um, because they killed it. It was Lake Austin, uh, which is part of the, the Highland chain of lakes in Austin, Texas. And it was a punching frogging swim bait uh, dream. I mean, like I grew up fishing it and didn't really know the gem that I had until it was gone, but it's surrounded by $10 million mansions. And they kind of got sick of hydrilla getting in their oh, boats and their docks and mm. they put in to my knowledge a quarter million grass carp and it just Jeez. it it they said they were selective they would only eat invasive grasses but they ate every piece of invasive and native grass they ate all the lily pads they ate the cattails they ate uh eventually when people were cutting their grass on the side of the lake the carp would literally be eating the grass clippings and now I've caught many a carp on a jerk bait, a red rattle trap. It's uh, they became cannibalistic at times, and so that was the best lake. Now it no longer exists, and there's still big bass in there. They didn't go away, but I, I know a lot of them did die. You know, there's still ten pounders in there, uh, and I think a thirteen something was caught this year. But it's not the lake it used to be. But I have I still have to go with that because maybe one day it'll come back. Maybe there's roots left that the carp couldn't quite get down to in the mud somewhere down there. But uh, that was my favorite lake to punch. Lake Austin. I don't think I've ever, have you ever heard of that, Andrew? You, it was, it was ranked number eight on Bassmaster's list in like 2014. And then the grass carp got put in like 2015 and it, it died. It was unbelievable. I talked about it in my podcast with a guy named Brad Casebeer, who was actually, he's in the trades. He, uh, he worked in plumbing for a long time and now he just sold this plumbing company for $27 million or something. Like, <laughs> incredibly successful guy. But he was here for both the rise and the fall of Lake Austin, where I kind of came into the fishing world, like the, the top peak of it. But he fished all the Wednesday night tournaments they have out there, which are a three hour tournament from 6.30 to 9.30. And so half the tournament or most, uh, an hour of the tournament's in the dark. In like the, the, the heyday of Lake Austin, on a Wednesday night, it would take 25 to 35 pounds every single Wednesday to win. Oh my God. <laughs> on a three hour night tournament. It's insanity. What the? And they put in the grass carp and they ate through that thing in a matter of months. And they had a they had a, a Saturday tournament with a few hundred boats out there, or maybe 150 boats out there, and some guys caught. It was the biggest, I think, the biggest stringer ever out there on the last like last flat of grass left, and they got it to themselves. So they got their first. They caught three eights on one a rig cast, and then two tens on the next a rig cast. Oh my gosh! So it it was an insane lake when the grass was going, but it's uh it's no longer no longer happening. That sucks. Yeah, we we're experiencing that up here too. There's they spray all of our lakes. Are they really? Oh, dude, it's absurd. Gosh, so yeah. unfortunate. 
yeah i i've been i've been chatting with a few folks about starting a trying to start a movement against quitting that but i don't know how much yeah, we're gonna have good, because good like you mentioned earlier is the fishing community isn't known to have money no money money talks and and that's why the the you know millionaires and billionaires on lake austin put the carp in there and texas parks and wildlife went along with it and you're gonna have the same thing happen all over the place yeah it sucks it does it does yeah. it does well someone had, taylor said about kevin's retirement kevin hasn't retired i don't know what he's saying <laughs> Yeah, I was, saw that, and I'm literally in my other screen here. I've been researching it, and I'm like, because I'm like, I feel like I would have seen something about that by now. Now, Kevin, but. Kevin, Kevin just did. Uh, he got eliminated from the tournament, so he did some live stream coverage. Hmm. I saw that. I saw yeah. him talking. I think it was more of a joke than anything. But oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was an April Fool's thing that we missed, or what? Maybe. No. I think it's more of like a, a salty joke of people still being mad about the separation of anglers leaving bass to hopefully find greener pastures. Oh, on the yeah, other yeah, side. I got mm. oh, Okay. So, yeah, well, one Tyler, of those deals. Well, dude, uh, is there anything you'd like the uh, the folks to know before we uh, we let you go here tonight? Man, I mean, I'm, my DMs are always open. I love talking fishing. I love talking life. And honestly, I love talking life more than fishing. So if they ever are struggling with things and just want encouragement, I'm, I'm always here for that. And uh, like I've, I've always said, my goal with all of this is, you know, growing the brand is great, but the, the brand is not my end goal. I want to I want to reach people with the gospel. And so that's that's my main goal. And if people want to hear about it, great. And if they don't, they can they can tune out to that certain part. But that's what's important in my life. And that's what I'm going to, you know, make my my whole goal. So. If people want to chat about life, I'm just I'm here to here to hang and, and chat. Heck yeah, dude! I think a lot of people appreciate that. So, uh, uh, and we appreciate you taking the time yeah, out thank you. of your night to uh, come on the show. Of uh, course, it's been a blast to obviously learn about you and your story, uh, and also learn some uh, some some branding tips for and for anyone not just ourselves, but for for folks that are looking to not only get in the industry but maybe grow their brand, whether it's fishing or not fishing. Maybe it's something completely different. Yeah. You know, maybe it's Frisbee golf. You know, maybe that's something they want to do. It's a lot of really doing man things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but dude, we really appreciate you taking the time out. You are always welcome on the show. And uh, obviously we'll be, we'll be talking to you soon. Of course. Appreciate it guys. Yeah. All right, dude. Well, I hopefully will see you in two weeks at the classic. And, that's in two uh, weeks. Yeah. yeah, man. Oh my goodness. All right. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully i'll see you there buddy and uh safe travels back to texas good stuff i'll see you guys all right see you Tyler. a Dude. lot a lot of juicy stuff to come out of that folks absolutely yeah Dude, you know it's funny it's just thinking about the classic right because you're going to be down there through what the 12th or is it the 13th it ends i leave the third because practice for the classic on possum kingdom starts that sunday so that sunday is the sixth i started driving the third because it's 22 and a half hour drive uh driving the third getting the airbnb on, on the fourth i'm gonna take this saturday to rig up completely uh, and also take time to drive around the lake and check out launches and then settle in and then so practice sunday the sixth to the eighth wednesday and thursday are competition days and then i'm working the classic on the 11th to the 13th. So again, that, like we mentioned earlier, if you're going to be at the classic and you listen to this, uh, hit me up. It'd be cool to, uh, you know, grab a beer, say hello, whatever, but if, if you're going to the expo or not, um, it'd be cool to, uh, to obviously meet up and meet a bunch of you guys that listen to the show. Um, so that'd be really awesome. But, uh, yeah, Taylor, uh, I think that's definitely a rumor you heard on Bass Boat Central. I don't think that's true that Kevin Van Dam's retiring. Cause that would be, Probably the biggest news in bass fishing in a very long time. If yeah, Dan's retiring. I don't think he'll ever retire. Honestly, I think he's, he's gonna pull a Rick Hunt, and he'll be just around for kind of like ever. Like David Fritz, been around forever. Mm -hmm. Gary Klein, been around forever. Like Roland Martin, I think still fishes, like basically professionally. So around forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, Taylor, you mentioned earlier where we're at. Where uh, I'm Central New York, so like Rochester area. And Andy's over in the good old buffaloes, guiding on probably one of the best, if not the best, smallmouth fishery in the world. Yeah, it's been pretty dang good. <laughs> yeah, I've I seen that. We had a question way back here. Hold on. Oh, Stout Sportsman asked about a fish kill on Cayuga. 
I think we were talking about that a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. I don't I haven't heard back yet. Um I had a buddy that was checking with DEC to see if that was in fact true. Uh don't know if it is, but I will obviously get back to you if so. But uh I mean this weekend was interesting. Kind of getting Andrew, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to talk about this yeah, in perspective. Um, so we had a tournament this past weekend on Cayuga and uh, Friday night. I, I practiced Thursday evening, Friday morning, and Friday evening after I worked um, and basically found a whole lot of females on beds. And I had anticipated, you know, obviously kayak tournaments are five longest bass. So five fish, a five pounder typically, typically is about 20 inches, give or take. I thought it genuinely was going to take a hundred inches to win this dirt. Um, I show up Saturday morning after Friday night, seeing giants on bed. I probably had rough, you know, roughly give or take 26 to 28 pounds, roughly don't quote me uh, that were on beds. And I have a whole story to come with this. Um, so I was anticipating fireworks, what, what have you show up Saturday morning it is dirty as can be, and there were carp everywhere along the shoreline. They were all doing the dirty, and you could barely, like, when we were launching, you could barely hear, like, talking to a buddy who was 10 yards away, you could barely hear each other because they were so loud with splashing and going crazy in the water. Like, it was that bad. Um, and I didn't think about it till I got to my spot and saw how blown out it was and how carp were everywhere that when I started trying to pick off the waypoints where I had beds where I knew they were at and nothing happening, I wonder how big of a factor carp spawn plays into these largemouth trying to spawn because they were gone. There were a couple males that were spawning that I picked off, you know, within the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But other than that, it was, it was not what it was 12 hours before. Yeah. And I bet it has a lot to do with it because the carp is such a big fish. <laughs> The, all that ruckus and noise, it I'm sure it just pushes them out of there. Or if there's dirty water too, it just makes them a little harder to see. And spawning fish in dirtier water are typically a lot harder to catch. You almost have to hit them right on the head. Mm -hmm. So if they're roaming and moving around because you have all these big carp splashing around, they could have been there guarding their beds, but because you couldn't see them, you couldn't make that perfect cast. Or the female bass just tend to do their deal and leave within like 12 hours. So you could have found them Friday morning and by Saturday morning, they were already done and gone. And then it was just males hanging around. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't mind talking about it now because I don't have a term there until ours till July. Yeah. Till, till yours pretty much. End of June. Yeah. End of June. Uh, basically a lot of my beds and what I did on Saturday were on pad stems because the area I was in the bottom, the bottom was not hard. So they needed something to spawn on and they spawn on pad stems. I saw so many guys go through there and they avoided the pad stems. So I pretty much had it all to myself, had a grass deal, figured that out. Basically had a limit of all 18s, like literally at 18 to 18 and a quarter. That is all I had. Uh, and then made a run. I say a run and I joke about this, a run. It was a mile and a half, so 20 minutes on a kayak, um, to a five-pounder I had on the bed on the complete side, hoping she was there. She was there, caught her first flip, didn't find any other fish around her for the next 10, 15 minutes, so went all the way back uh, and fished some some grass that was starting to grow. And uh, that was I, – I had 93 inches, and that was from majority of those those 18s coming from, from punching the, the isolated grass clumps that started to grow. Mm -hmm. And I was leaving to go to awards at the end of the tournament. And I looked at my buddy Forrest and I said, dude, I might've gotten top 10, but like, that was bad. Like 93 inches sucks on this place. And apparently it sucked for everybody because I won the dang thing with 93 inches on probably the best largemouth fishery in the Northeast. Yeah. It, it was, it was crazy to think how much carp can affect that. Cause like oh. they pulled off and like I I tried fishing some certain grass clumps that might have been a, a step a, a start like a staging spot for them to come back out like maybe they were just done because we did have a very bright moon that night because I think in two days we have a full moon yeah so maybe they were just done I, I don't know 
it's why I, we mentioned in last week's episode on Friday, you cannot have a lot of confidence go into going into a spawn derby because those fish can move so much. Yeah, they're kind of like smallmouth when they're feeding. It's here one day, gone the next. And usually what happens is the big females will pull off and you'll get left with these two-pound males or one- to two-pound males, and your whole game plan is screwed. Mm -hmm. I We do have the luxury a lot of times in New York that the water's clean. Those big ones will hang around for a few days in the general vicinity. Mm -hmm. But if that water changes or any conditions change, they just drop their eggs and go. They get a little bit more comfortable in that clear water because obviously that's what they're comfortable to spawn in, so they're going to be there, like you mentioned. So, like, when that, what was crazy was that – water becoming crystal clear because it was an aquarium thursday yeah. and friday i told you this like i called you and i said dude there's 20 pounds everywhere you go yeah at, at least at least 20 and when we came back saturday morning it was that dirty there was no rain there was no wind there was nothing friday night that it was crazy how much those carp dirtied that water oh yeah it was nuts they're like, big powerful fish yeah and I mean, these were these are giant freaking carp. I mean, like I thought I was in Florida going over manatees again in the kayak. Like that's essentially <laughs> what was happening, dude. I saw some guy rise his kayak rose up like six inches from going over top of carp in shallow water. I mean, it's it, it was crazy. But regardless, it was it was fun. It was fun getting on a post spawn grass deal already, which was a lot of fun. I love that. Yeah, I can't wait to start grass fishing. I. I love smallmouth to a passion, but there's just something about uh, hitting largemouth with a big old flipping stick and like 20 pound test or 50 pound braid or whatever your um, choice of ice cream is in that situation. I just, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. We had Jake Boom around from Alpha Angler the other week, and uh, I used the hitter. It's a 7 6 heavy fast, 20 pound floral crowd okay, 8 to 2. And giving him the beans on that thing, that was a lot of fun. Oh, I'm sure. Like, Manhandle the four pounder, like cracked him right out of the grass. It was a lot of fun. But, uh, but dude, we got some pretty cool stuff coming up in the works. Tonight's episode is obviously a lot of fun with Tyler. Uh, so for those who, I know there's there's a lot of people who are aspiring, you know, maybe not YouTubers, but want to create create their own brand and obviously grow something um, for themselves to present themselves to either sponsors or document or. Maybe it's just a hobby they want to improve on. Yeah. Um, tonight was the episode for you guys. They obviously learn a lot about that. So that was pretty cool. And obviously appreciate Tyler for tuning in. Uh, really appreciate him taking the time out. Um, it's really cool to to see a lot of not just Tyler, but like um, a lot of these big pros or weekend anglers, guys that you know work their ass off from a nine to five that take a lot of their you – know, take an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes some of these guys will – I mean, you know, Caleb Bell's in here, a good buddy of ours. He'll take two and a half hours out of his night to come talk fishing with us, and it really does mean a lot. So we really yeah. appreciate all of our guests Everyone. because because we don't pay these guys to come on. We're asking them to take an hour, two hours out of their week to obviously come on and and teach you guys to teach us. Um, and obviously, we obviously appreciate that. It means the world. Uh, and in stride with that, we appreciate everyone. In the chat right now, that's obviously designated time to sit here and watch this because you think it's entertaining. I don't know why you think Andrew and I are entertaining, but I'm not going to question it. Be so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, you oh. must just like to say <laughs> you're just uh, what do they call it back in the? Uh, oh my gosh, what was the? It's not a clown. What is the? Uh, not the dunce. What is it called back in the the medieval times? The uh, do you know what I'm trying to talk about? Yeah. Oh. The guy who's who, the guy who was meant to be entertainment to the king and queen. Oh. I, basically, that's what we are to the folks. <laughs> we're, we're just a laughing stock. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, but Speaking for real, which, laughing stock. We do need to get one more question in here for a jester. Yes, thank you, Kyle. Jester? Yeah, I, I almost want to send him a second. Gladiators. I would like to think we're yes. <laughs> oh, gladiators. Like Flipping stick jousting session. Let's go. <laughs> there, there we you, go. You're on your hobby, and I'm on my triton. I'm coming at you to 40. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah, we both have seven sixes just like jousting, and you're just flying, and I'm just like, you're flying, and I'm just. <laughs> 
It's like a Ferrari in a freaking wheelchair. Yes, it's wild. That that is wild. So uh, we do need um another bag of coffee here. So what are you thinking? Let's see. Um, we gave Kyle obviously some coffee here. I'm trying to think of another good question here that uh, obviously is good for the folks. If you guys still have questions that are maybe something you want Andy yeah. and I to talk about here for a second. I think know. I'm going to go Simon with his GoPro. Where did you yeah, start with yeah. basic GoPro? What do you use now for getting the best video content editing or recommend for someone attempting to start YouTube videos? So, I, I mean, I think that was a good starting point. And um, I think I'm going to go with Simon. Do you, Simon? you think oh, that's yeah, good? Dude. Hell yeah. Simon is, Simon is good people. I stayed with Simon at Chickamauga uh, State Championship last year at Oneida. Um, Simon, will if you're still listening, buddy, we're going to get you some coffee sent out your way. We got hopefully you like coffee. Yeah, hopefully he likes coffee. Uh, but now, for real folks, we, we're trying to add more giveaways to these Monday Night Lives for you guys to tune in and obviously not only receive information from our guests that we have on the show, but obviously receive some cool product um, from, you know, obviously our, our show partners. So hopefully there's more coming in the works. We are already in talks for uh, 2022 with a lot of our partners and some potential new partners for – the new season. Um, so hopefully is <laughs> there Simon. <laughs> so Simon, we'll get that sent out to you, buddy. Um, but uh, hopefully we have some new stuff that we can start giving away some big time stuff because uh, guys, we're making a lot of strides of this show and uh, it's really cool to see. Thank where we're you taking for this always thing. tuning in and listening and downloading our, our little talk show here because I mean, I never thought people would want to listen to me. Bailey is much more personable and a better talker. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the reason why we started the show, Andrew, is because typically we can't shut up. Yeah. So this is why we talk. But apparently like people like to, to listen to us speak. So uh, either that or, or they just like to listen to us as comedy because we don't have no idea what we're talking about. But either way, we appreciate everybody that's, uh, that tunes in. Um, I believe, Andrew, that does it. For tonight's show is there anything else that we should go over um just real quick i have my new york state license guide now so i can actually do anywhere in new york state so if you want to go largemouth fishing let me know we can go get on a frog bite this summer um but on top of it i also am going to be guiding salmon steelhead and brown trout come this fall so make sure you hit me up for those trips because those are going to be a riot not only do I bass fish, but I also know how to steelhead fish. They're all walk-in flow trips. Um, we'll be using long noodle rods and catching giant silver cromers and brown trout and dying king salmon if you want, whatever. But, yeah. Heck, yeah. I think I guess the last thing for – and on top of that, obviously get in touch with Andy if you want to get on some big small laser steelhead and uh, pretty much anything under the sun because Andrew can catch it if it's in New York. Um Maybe. But, uh, <laughs> but guys, something to be on the lookout. Now we, we still have a bunch of you guys in here. Um, in two weeks, obviously, is the Bass Master Classic and the Bass Kaya Classic that I'm competing in. Look out for a three- to four-part video series that I'm going to be putting together for that entire trip. Uh, I'm going to vlog the entire way down to Texas. Uh, I'm going to have a whole part on the whole travel series down there uh, and getting ready. And I'm going to have another part on all of practice another part for um, the tournament. So I think it's actually going to be a three-parter. I was going to probably do the expo, but but if seeing as I'm working it, I probably won't have any time to obviously create any film. So a three-part video series coming out. And it's actually – I'm going to try to put uh, two to three GoPros on the Yak so you guys can have different angles. Uh, We're going to get some drone footage in there. I'm going to call the – the, uh, the actual lake is a a river system. So they actually – it's dam regulated, which dams have specific drone rules calling them tomorrow actually to confirm that I can fly a drone for one. I have to call the tournament director to make sure I can fly a drone before practice. Cause I don't know if I'd get DQ'd for trying to do something too early, but whatever, basically I'm rambling, but uh, I'm doing a pretty in-depth video series. Going to show you guys ever all everything, travel, practice, ups and downs, failures, success. However, it lays out um, everything will be posted and uh, hopefully you guys will tune in for that. Uh, we're getting some pretty cool sponsor involvement. Uh, Amped Outdoors is huge in backing this video series, uh, making this a lot easier on me to be able to do that travel-wise. And um, 
If you guys have not checked out Amped yet, if you're looking to get into affordable lithium batteries, like I know these are still expensive, but like if you look at them compared to the competition, they are affordable batteries that, that uh, will actually outperform some of the more expensive ones. The people competition, yeah, Mike, I'm going to fly the drone to the guys' houses that they're when all they're rigging up and just see what they're, they're putting on. Uh. <laughs> but no, it's a huge shout out to Amped and uh, Ice Hole Power uh, as well. They're going to be hooking us up for the trip down. And I uh, really appreciate those guys. So I need to give them a little bit of love. And obviously, it will be more as we get closer to obviously when we leave. We leave in less than two weeks. 22 and a half hour drive. And then you get home and we have a derby like two days later, bud. So you yeah, get ready. home and literally I have no time to settle because I have to go practice for Andrew and I. <laughs> oh, you don't have to practice for that one because that's Chautauqua. So. Oh, is it Chautauqua? Yeah, Why Chautauqua's am I thinking Cayuga. the oh. uh, weekend after. Oh, okay. Uh, well, yeah. That one I have to practice for. Yeah. Woohoo. <laughs> we go blind. That's Either fine, way, folks. We have enough spots. Yeah, hopefully we can actually put out tournament, uh, tournament videos for you guys. So uh, look out for that. And, but as always, folks, we appreciate you, and we will see you guys on Friday.